Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining my talk, my presentation on data governance and the art of the fugue. My name is Randy Gordon. I'd like to thank Bright Talk for giving me this opportunity, and in particular, Casey Alexander for helping me through the process and giving me the chance to do a couple dry runs. So I'll begin with a little bit about myself. I am a data governance leader with over 10 years experience in the financial services. Previous employers include Moody's and Bank of America. I have an MS degree in management financial services from RPI, but my undergraduate degree is a bachelor of music in cello performance from the Hart School of Music, University of Hartford. And that's relevant to our discussion today. So this presentation is based on an article that I wrote a couple months back, and it was one of three in a series that I called Towards Data Governance's Fourth Era. And my friend and data governance consultant extraordinaire, Bob Steiner, was kind enough to publish these in his tdan.com newsletter, newsletter, the data administration newsletter. When I thought about doing this talk, I was going to focus on the middle article, the second article, which is data governance, the art of the few, but I found as I put this together, I had to include some portions of the first article or else what I was going to talk about wouldn't make sense. And then because my second article kind of leaves people hanging, I realized I had to at least tie in some things that I put in the third article, which means we're covering a lot of space and time in this discussion. And that's probably over ambitious because I do want to keep this to 30 to 35 minutes and that includes some music. So, but bear with me, we'll, we'll start with this new age of exploding data volume and variety and accelerating technological change, which I think has made data governance, at least the way we had practiced it up until re recently, very difficult. And that in my mind means we have to redefine what data governance's goal is in this new age. So we'll talk about that. So we'll start with the present. When we talk about data governance goal, we'll actually skip back to the eighties and we'll talk about a book about how a physics teacher helps save a manufacturing plant. I'm sure you're thinking, what does that have to do with anything? Well, hopefully it'll make sense. Um, and then we'll get to the meat of the discussion, data governance and the art of the fugue, after which I'll bring it back to the present with a proposed goal, proposed new goal and approach to data governance, which takes into account those phenomenon, which we'll talk about in the beginning. So again, that's a lot of space and time because when we talk about the few, we're going back to Box Day, which is over 270 years ago. So as the teacher would say on the magic school bus, seat belts, please, we'll start. So when I wrote about the explosion of data back in my first article in February, that was before the COVID-19 pandemic really hit, and that has really proven the point. I, I found an interesting article in the Harvard Business Journal, which COVID-19 data can you trust? And I like this quote about the fact the pandemic has been studied more intensely in a shorter amount of time than any other human event. Our globalized world has rapidly generated and shared a vast amount of information about it. And I, I think we all feel that, right? We see all the statistics, we see all the models, we, in this area of New York, we tune into the governor's uh, press conference every day to hear the numbers. And it's not just the volume of data, it's the variety of data. You've got clinical data, which I think is largely structured data, but you have Internet of Things data too, right? You've got all the information being generated from those apps, uh, tracking people's movements. You've got traffic pattern data to try to understand whether people are following the stay at home orders. You've even got social media data, looking at sentiment data and the like. So huge amounts of data, structured, unstructured, every kind of data. And we've seen how data can affect things like models, all those models that were wrong. We've even, even seen clinical studies from respected institutions withdrawn because the data was incorrect. 
So, so obviously a huge challenge for data governance here. So that's one aspect. The, the other aspect is the revolution in software development. And I'll talk briefly about agile and DevOps. Now, neither of these are particularly new. Agile development has really been around 20 years, really, I think, took off the beginning of the last decade, 2010 or so. And I think everyone's familiar with the key points about that, shortening the development cycles, breaking that rigid waterfall sequence, and building a collaborative effort around cross-functional self-organizing teams. I know from experience that Agile has posed the challenge to the more traditional approach to data governance in, in determining how do you review when development's happening that fast. But then you have DevOps. Again, DevOps isn't exactly new. I, I think the first DevOps day was back in 2009, but it's really picked up steam in the last several years. And it has those concepts of continuous integration and continuous delivery, which is drastically decreasing the lifespan of software development, really from months to minutes. You have smaller implementations that can be done very quickly. And that's changed the expectation, I think, of consumers and, and businesses. I, I quote Chris Berg from Data Kitchen from an article uh, back in 2017, businesses demand analytics at Amazon speed. So we see how quickly Amazon can do things. Everyone expects things to be done that quickly. Uh, of course, Data Kitchen, as people may be aware, is a pioneer in the field of another ops, data ops. And I'll talk more about that later. But you've got this complete change, I think, in how fast development happens and implementation happens. You've got that massive amount of data. And the question I asked myself really back uh, the end of last year, after I had really learned about DevOps is, how does data governance adapt to a world where that deliberate, thoughtful, thorough, time-consuming process of data governance seems irrelevant? So it was interesting. I, I had just finished a book called The Phoenix Project, which I sure people are familiar with who uh, know about DevOps because it's a book about DevOps by Gene Kim, George Baffert, and Kevin Baer. Um, and I had also been reading about DevOps, reading publications by Data Kitchen and Chris Berg also, that Chris Berg and the authors of the Phoenix Project all cited this book called The Goal, which is a book from the 80s. And it's by Eliyahu Goldrat, who's a physicist. And Goldrat in the 80s brought a scientific approach to looking at manufacturing, which truly revolutionized the world of manufacturing. He introduced the theory of constraints. He did a lot in total quality management. But, but it was very interesting that it was taking a non-business, non-manufacturing approach and, and using it to evaluate manufacturing differently. And, and the goal is in the form of a story. In fact, when I found my copy, it was in the fiction section of a New York City library branch. And it tells the story of a plant manager who's about to have his plant shut down and he happens to run into his college physics professor. And the physics professor asked him, well, what do you think the goal is of, the, of your plant? And the plant manager said, well, it's to be productive and to turn out product. And the phys physics teacher said, well, I don't know if that's true. Why don't you think about it? And so the book goes on. It's a really good book. I'm not going to spoil it for anybody. Maybe a little dated in some ways, but it's a very good book. And as the plant manager thinks about this, he comes to the realization that the goal for his plant was different than what he had thought. And through that realization, it really reshapes his whole management approach and turns things around. So I thought about that and I thought, well, I'm not a physicist, but if Goldratt's physicist training, his education helped him reframe manufacturing, the goal of manufacturing, could my education as a classical musician provide me a fresh perspective on the goal of data governance? And I started to think about this and I, I thought about data governance providing structure and I always liked that about data governance. And when I put that together and I thought, okay, from a music perspective, what does that mean? Immediately what came into mind for me was The Art of the Fugue by J.S. Bach. I was somewhat surprised that this would come to my mind just because I don't think I had listened to The Art of the Fugue since I was in music school. 
But sure enough, I thought about it and I thought, wow, that that is something interesting. So a little bit about J.S. Bach and the art of the fugue. Uh, J.S. Bach lived from 1685 to 1750. He is certainly one of the greatest composers of all time, one of the most prolific. He wrote over 1,100 pieces of music in many, many fugues. And he's certainly considered the master of fugue. And we'll talk about what a fugue is in a moment. Uh, fugues began in the Renaissance and fugues continue to be written today, but, but no one really mastered that musical structure like Bach. Now, the art of the fugue was one of Bach's last works, and it consists of 16 fugues. There's also four canons. Canons are like rounds. I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. And it was interesting. I, I didn't know this until I started to do some research, but I happened upon the fact that the book Goodell, Escher Bach, and Eternal Golden Braid by Douglas Hofstadter, which had won the Pulitzer Prize, and was really about artificial intelligence, had a lot about the art of the fugue in it. And it's really fascinating that Hofstadter came upon this and, and, and referenced it so much in a book about artificial intelligence. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to play the first fugue. It's called a contrapunctus by Bach in this particular piece. I don't know if he used that term otherwise. Now, as I said, it was one of the last works he wrote and he didn't leave information as to how he wanted it played in terms of instruments. It's not clear if he wanted it played on organ or piano or a group of instruments. So, so that's been good in a way because there's many recordings out there with different instrumentation. And the one I came upon, which I referenced in my article and I'll use today is by the Emerson String Quartet. Which, which is one of my favorite string quartets. It's actually one where I know the members or original members who recorded this version personally. And I've listed the information on here. The slides are available in the attachments because I think it's a really wonderful introduction to this music. Now, we'll see how this works. It's it been interesting. It was an interesting challenge to find the best way to play the music and have it come across the listener in the least distorted manner possible. I, I do urge people to actually listen to the YouTube version or the recording um, yourselves to really get the beauty of the music. But I think I found the best approach to this and we'll see how it works. Now, one tip, we'll talk more about fugues in a moment. Well, here's a tip. You'll hear one instrument, a violin. By the way, string quartet, has two violins, a viola, which is sort of a big violin, a pitched a little bit lower, and a cello, which happens to be the instrument I play. So four string instruments, and you'll hear one violin play a melody at the beginning by itself. It's a pretty simple melody. Uh, listen for that carefully, because you'll hear it again and again, but different by different instruments in different ways. So this is about three minutes. So you get a break from me for three minutes. And if you hear me having to start some things again, it's just because I'm trying to do this off my phone with an external speaker, but I think I have everything all set. So here it goes. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
So that is a fugue. And I imagine most people are listening to that and thinking, well, that sounds lovely, but really complicated. And part of it is we're not used to listening to this kind of music anymore. So I want to quickly introduce you to three important musical terms and how they relate to data. Homophony, polyphony, and cacophony. So, Homophony is the kind of music we really are most accustomed to hearing, whether it's pop, rock, jazz, movie music, musicals, even most classical music since Bach's time. And the key thing about homophony is there's, there's one voice, one part that clearly has the melody, the tune. Might be a singer, might be an instrument. Even if it's a piano, you've got one clearer melody being played. And then you may have lots of other voices, parts, whatever, but they're, they're, just, they're secondary, they're a complement. And it might be a simple accompaniment uh, with chords from a guitar, it might be very complex, but still there's a primary voice. That's the melody and that's what you focus on. And I think of this as how we have traditionally viewed data up until fairly recently. We, we focus on one set of data at a time, whether it's for a particular report or a transaction or whatever. And we really work on trying to get that set of data correct and really understand it. We filter a lot of the other data out that we don't think is relevant. We, we might be interested in some of the other data because maybe the data we are most interested in is derived from that. But still, we're, we're, we're kind of focused in a very homophonic way on, on data up until recently. Now, this fugue is polyphonic music. Polyphony employs two or more simultaneous but relatively independent melodic lines. And in the few you just heard, there's four. Nothing new about polyphony. It actually goes way back to the Middle Ages. It was very common. It was really the most common kind of music through Box Day around 1750. Homophonic music really took off from there. Um, when I think about data today, and you get back to that discussion about all the different types of COVID-19 data, I think data today resembles polyphonic music much more than homophonic music. There, there's so many types of data, there, there's so much data, and, and we want to look at that wide variety of data, wide amount of data, and look for correlations and look for relationships. We're not just trying to focus on a narrow set of data. However, it's not easy to put all these multiple voices together. And if you combine sounds without any guidelines, you get cacophony, which is really noise. And I think of how data lakes become data swamps, and to me, that is data cacophony, because you have a data swamp which is filled with incomprehensible information, which is useless, because there's no guidelines, there's no governance. Now, composers use uh, guidelines called counterpoint that helps them put together these different lines of music, different melodies. Um, but more precisely for the fugue, there's a fugue governance framework. And I think this is very similar to data governance frameworks, but, it, but it's remarkably simple considering how complex fugues can get. 
but it really helps both the composer and the listener the composer write these amazing works and the listener actually understand them. Um, I, I draw on a book about fugue by Roger Bullivant because actually when I was in music school, I, I loved playing fugues, but I was very focused on performance. I didn't take a lot of academic music courses. I never studied counterpoint. So when this idea popped into my head, I, I thought, gee, I should actually find out what I'm talking about. So it was very interesting to understand how simple that framework is because there's really three principles. There's a definite subject stated at the beginning. You remember that melody I asked you to listen for stated by the solo violin. All fugues start with a subject, often played by one instrument or sung by one voice, not necessarily, but you can tell the subject stated there. And then other parts, other voices take up the subject using imitation. Now, I think we're all familiar with a very simple kind of imitation, which is the imitation from rounds, musical rounds, Frere Jaca, Row, 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 Your Boat. I think we've all sung those where one person or group of people starts singing Row, 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 Your Boat. Second group comes in a few seconds later and sings exactly the same thing and then another group and it, and, and it sounds good, it, right? It sounds very harmonious if you wish. It's not that interesting because all you are doing is repeating what the other group just sang. A, a more formal word uh, word for rounds is canons, and and music and composers write canons. Bach wrote some canons as part of the art of fugue, uh, but but again, they're they're limited because it's basically one voice doing exactly the same as previous voice. But imitations used in the fugue, and then there's this contrapuntal texture, which really means there is just different melodic lines going on at all points, and the subject is appearing sometimes in upper voice, middle voice, lower voice. And I just wanna play again, the opening of that fugue and I'll talk through it. I'll try to be heard over the music and, and just point out where the subject comes in because it's really interesting. So here's your subject, the first statement of that subject by the first violin. Now the second violin takes it up. First violin goes off and starts playing something different. And now the cello, so the lowest instrument, the bass part of the quartet, plays the subject. And now the viola, which is the middle instrument, is playing. And you hear the two violins are playing something, the cello is playing something, and the texture gets quite complex. So again, by you can listen to that subject and you can understand in certain cases, most cases, what's going on. So just as a data governance framework, we'll have high level principles and then some detail policies or standards. So does this few governance framework have really one policy or standard, one more detailed rule. It has to do with that first imitation of the subject. It's traditionally called the answer. And the rule is that that answer has to start on a different note than the first statements of the subject. Again, that's very different from around. You always start with the same note. Um, because you have to follow this rule as a composer to start on a different note of than the, than the subject, the original statement, you have to make some decisions. You have to decide whether you modify your subject because for those of you familiar with musical scales, you know the distance between each note and the scale is different. It can be a whole step or half step. So when you start a melody on a different note of a scale, it can sound different. And so there's various rules a composer needs to use as guidelines, but that's part of what's the interesting challenge of a fugue is they, they will often modify that subject, but only enough to make it still sound good because it's very important that you don't lose the character, that you can still recognize the subject. And you can hear that, I'll just play the very beginning of this again, and listen carefully to that first imitation, which is the answer. So there's the answer. 
And it's really subtle. Actually, in the answer, Bach reduces the distance between the musical distance between the first and the second note. Before it was five notes, now it's only four. It's very subtle. You still hear it as a subject, but it works and it helps, in his case, emphasize that we're in a certain key. So co composers do different things and they start on different notes, but that's the detailed rule that they follow. That really is the fugue governance framework. It's that simple. If you go on and I urge you to listen to all the fugues of Art of the Fugue, you hear Bach invent so many amazing variations using the same subject, using the same subject. He uses the same subject in every one of those views. And yet the framework allows him to create so much variety. Um, and that, that subject is very important. I, I like to think about it, about it as a buoy the composer leaves for the listener to navigate the melodic eddies of the few. And there's a corollary in data governance, I believe, and that's metadata and data lineage. And, and metadata and data lineage is what can help the user of the data understand, navigate through huge amounts of very disparate data if we have metadata and data lineage. So I had this idea that just as the few governance framework, which, which I would love to say was created by some secretive few governance console that was made of famous composers, but there's no such thing. That'd be much more interesting. Um, but that if the goal of the few governance structure is to provide a structure for creativity, then perhaps the goal of data governance should be providing the structure for invention. And it's funny, I, I came to invention rather than innovation because I thought innovation is used a lot. But I really like the definition of invention in this context because beyond the obvious, well, it's an invention, in Merriam-Webster, the definition includes productive imagination, inventiveness, discovery, and finding, which I think is all about what we want to do with data today. Again, I think the purpose of the rules guiding principles of the few is to provide a structure for invention, for creativity, uh, and most relevant to data context, discovery and finding. So I, I, I ended my second article with this as the goal of data governance. I thought, well, that's nice. People will think it's poetic, but they also will think, how do I practically apply that? So. I thought about, okay, so what are the implications? Again, going back to the book, The Goal, once the plant manager understood what the goal was, it changed his whole approach to how to run the plant. And I thought, okay, so what are the implications? If, if I hypothesize that the goal of data governance is to provide a structure for invention, to provide a structure for productive imagination, for discovery or finding, what does that mean? And, and what do we do with it? So how do we translate that new goal into actionable principles and metrics? Well, again, one of the concepts in the book, the goal was once the plant manager figured out what that goal was, I am not going to spoil the book for anyone. I'm still not going to say what it was. He realized that in his plant, he'd have to convert that to some measurable metrics that would make sense to his plant. And I thought, okay, well, I probably would need to consider how do you translate this to actionable principles and metrics? And it seemed to me when I thought about the data principles I had worked with for many years, there's a few that really do apply to what the user needs from data to drive invention. I think the user needs to understand the data. If the, the user doesn't understand the data, they're going to have to spend tons of their time and energy trying to figure it out. If they don't have business glossary, if they don't have metadata, if they don't understand the lineage, it, their mind will be too cluttered to be inventive. They certainly need to rely on the data, right? They need to trust it. They need to know it's fit for purpose. Um, and, and they need easy access to the data that they need to be inventive, be creative, be innovative, but only the data they're permitted to use. So you have a balance here between ease of access and control, which is really important. Again, you want, don't want the user worrying about, oh my God, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to see this data. So, so I, I feel very strongly these are the right principles to support this goal. The, the question to me was, well, how do you measure them? And this is where data ops to me came in. And, and data ops again, is the newer of those ops. 
couple years old now, but really gaining prom, uh, prominence. And the way I think about it is it's really the data-centric fusion of Agile, DevOps, we've talked about it, and statistical process control, which is a lean manufacturing approach. I believe that data ops is the means to operationalize data governance because it focuses on automated testing of data each step in a data pipeline. So the process by which data is prepared for, well, whatever use, analytics, reporting, transactions, and, and using that information from those automated tests to fuel continuous improvement. And in that light, the metrics I thought about for these, and I really mean these to be provocative, are how do you measure whether a user understands the data? Well, in a data ops context, I believe you want to look at the percentage of the relevant data pipelines, the processes that are preparing the data for whatever use case you're looking at, that have automated and that have automated tests in place for every step, including each data transformation. And my reasoning here is if you have done the work to understand each of those steps and test for them, then you are collecting that data the user needs to understand. You've collected the metadata the user needs to understand the data. Similarly, if you look at the reliability of data, well, if you've got your automated tests in place, you are by definition increasing the reliability and the trust of that data. The tricky one always is that uh, ease of access versus control. And what I've thought about is if you were to measure users' data queries run against authoritative sources of data. So you assume your authoritative data sources of data have the right control. Your authoritative sources of data have the right controls in place. Make sure the users are getting to the data they should be getting to and not other data. But if you've created a situation where users are going there more often than they're going to someplace else, and I think that's a good measure of this balance between ease of access and control. So what does this all mean? Well, early on in my work on this, I came across an article by Winston Chen from 2010 called A Brief History of Data Governance. And he postulated up till then there had been three eras of data governance. There was the application era from 1960 through 1990, which really focused on data's role within an individual application. You had the enterprise repository era where businesses realized it was very useful to bring data together into enterprise data warehouses and bring in master data management. And you, and you governed each of those repositories separately. And then the era that we've been living through, the policy era, is where we created really enterprise-wide policies and standards, and we attempted to govern data across applications, across repositories. And I believe that era is over, frankly, because I think it did a lot of good, but I think it's been stressed beyond its ability to deal with the volume of the data and the change in technology. So I, I believe we're in a new era, and that's the era of invention. And I finished my article saying, Justice composers and listeners alike have found the fugue, a framework for the invention and appreciation of musical works of genius. So data governance can enable individuals and organizations use of data to create potentially endless insights, providing value to businesses and societies. So we have covered a lot of ground and different ages in just under 35 minutes. And I thank you for your patience and I look forward to your questions. So let me see what I have. Um, question about, will there be a recording? A recording? Yes, there will be a re recording available. Um, but that should be available shortly. I think it will be available on the same link you use to get to this talk. I, by the way, have included in the attachments links to my articles. I've also included the slides uh, and on the last slide, I have, again, links to my articles, but also some suggestions for further reading. One of the books that I read during this process is a great book by Laura Madsen, Disrupting Data Governance, which I think comes from the same perspective I'm looking at that the purpose of data governance needs to change to be more about, as Laura says, getting data out there. Control is still important, but the, but the focus is less on 
keeping people away from data and more enabling people to access and understand the data they should access. Um, Hofstadter's book, Goodell, Escher, Bach, and the Eternal Golden Braid. I'm still reading it. I find it not an easy read, but it is fascinating. Uh, if you want to read in depth about Fugue, Roger Bolivant's book is great. And then Ryan Gross was one of my inspirations for my first article. Very interesting article he wrote for Medium, The Rise of Data Ops from the Ashes of Data Governance. So I will, again, be happy to take questions. If you want to send them to me uh, via LinkedIn, you can connect with me. As I said, I, I do um, suggest people listen, if they can, to all the fugues. Uh, you'll be amazed with the vast variety of what Bach does within that basic framework. And again, the fact is he's using the same subject throughout, so you can always listen for that if you get confused. It's always there someplace. He'll do things. At times, he'll stretch it out, he'll turn it upside down, but it's still recognizable. And I, I think the Emerson Quartet's performance is, is marvelous. Uh, I, I think they strike a good balance between not going overboard with interpretation, but, but, but still making a very, to me, very moving and passionate performance. So again, happy to take questions. There must be somebody out there with a question. Otherwise, I feel uh, I've probably given people a lot to think about. Ah, here's some questions. Um, okay, what guidance do you have about maintaining data quality in the era of big data, especially with multiple streams and topics? So I think it's very critical to know, to understand what the users consider important. I, I, this is where I think the concept of critical data elements still plays a big role. Um, I know Laura in her book talks about the importance of context with data. And, and, and so I think it, first of all, you have to understand what, what is important to your users. What, what, what are the elements, what are the fit for purpose um, constraints that they want in the data in terms of quality. But also I think it's important to not narrow the scope of what, not try to filter out too much data, not try to preempt what users might see. Again, you want to make sure they can't see data they're not allowed to see, private data or whatever. But but yeah, I, I do think it's important that we think carefully about narrowing the scope of so so in other words, if you're working with if if the user's looking at a set of data, they might immediately think, oh I only care about this, this, and this. Um, it's good to take a broader look because I think there'll be various ideas that will surface because of that broader look. And I, and I think that's what's different about dealing with these multiple streams. Um, let's see. With so much data and noise, how do you stay focused on the subject main purpose? Are there specific techniques or guidelines? So that's a really good question. Um, I, I, you know, what, one of the things I've often thought about with data governance is we sometimes don't think enough about asking the question of, so what's the business problem you're trying to solve? And, and how do we add business value by helping you solve that problem, help, helping you take care of that opportunity? Um, because I think we need to understand that when we think about frameworks and the like. Because I, I think sometimes we, we say we're just going to govern all the data without any uh, thought to what's important 
And, and I think it is really, so, so I think part of that is understanding the business problem, understanding the business opportunities and, and thinking broadly about those opportunities. Again, not trying to narrow the data. And from there, look to see if you can understand, okay, so, so amongst all this, what could be noise, although I think if you're governing it correctly and you're taking care of capturing the right metadata, you can use that to make sure you can sort things out. But again, really focusing on what is the business value in the data. Um, and, I, and I think, again, that, that connects that role about cacophony. I, and I think that, to me, that understanding the difference between cacophony and polyphony, I think when it comes to something like data lakes is really important. Because to me, a well-governed data lake would be a beautiful example of data polyphony. You could understand what's there, but there'd be a lot going on at once and you'd have transparency into what's going on. Again, I can't stress enough the importance of metadata. And that to me is why data catalogs, I think are a real important tool. Um, because you get, a, you know, if you lose track of that, if you lose track of the transparency, the ability for the user to understand what's in that data lake, um, then that is cacophony. And, and then basically people stop using it. Um, what advice would I have for companies just starting on the data journey, using data to transform their workflow regarding the importance of data governance? So I, I do think it's important these days to talk about data governance, not just from the perspective of control, which I think was very good to data governance uh, for the last decade because of the focus on meeting regulatory requirements and the like. But I, I think today people are asking more from data. They still want to comply with regulations and there are new regulations to worry about, like the uh, data privacy regulations. Uh, but, but they also, the, you know, they talk about exploiting data and monetizing data. Uh, they talk about data analytics. So I think it's important that we approach data governance with the idea that it is, as, as Laura Madsen says, about, about making the data usable, having the controls in place, making sure that uh, we, we meet those regulations, but, but also how can we expose the right data to the right people? How can we give them the information? How can we provide transparency to them? How can we help them navigate through these huge amounts of data um, and, and, and do it rapidly I, I think applying agile to data governance is really important but that, that to me is one of the things that i would really talk about if i'm selling data governance now is it's it's not just about controls it's about enhancing the ability to work with data. it's about stimulating creativity innovation and invention as far as suggesting any software I, yeah i've always tried in data governance to be very software agnostic uh, but i do believe data catalogs are an excellent tool towards that goal of helping people understand data, helping people to the data from the authoritative sources in, in, in a way that's understandable to the basic business user. So I, I think there's a lot of, I, I, to me, data catalogs are, are worth focusing on. I know it's relatively new, but I, I do think it's um, very, I would definitely look at data catalogs. I don't have a particular favorite. I haven't used any tools to any great degree, but I, but I do think that is a, a big step from, from metadata repositories, which are often basically designed for developers and, you know, of limited use to business people, business glossaries, yes, but otherwise, I, I do think data catalogs help us with that concept of understanding the data. All right, so I am about to close. I really appreciate your questions. Thanks for joining me and have a good rest of your day.